and you are dialed into the number one source for information on the Boston Red Sox minor league farm system on the web. This is the SoxProspects.com podcast. Thank you for the download. My name is Chris Hatfield. I'm the executive editor of SoxProspects.com. I'm coming to you once again from Sox Prospects Mid-Atlantic here in our nation's capital. We're coming off a great trip to spring training at the Fenway South Complex at JetBlue Park down in Fort Myers, Florida. Uh, we've got part two of our recap of what we saw, Ian and I. Uh, Ian Cuddle, our director of scouting, and I will recap what we saw down in Fort Myers. Uh, but first, what we're going to have for you is an interview that I did with Red Sox minor league outfielder Mike Myers. Uh, Myers, certainly not necessarily one of the top-rated prospects in the system, but Myers coming off a stint with Team Israel in the World Baseball Classic. World Baseball Classic, of course, right at the top of everybody's minds right now. Or uh, The second semifinal game is being played tonight. This is being recorded on Tuesday, March uh, the 21st. So really exciting time to talk about the World Baseball Classic. We talked to Mike about his time at Team Israel in Korea and Japan. Uh, that team was really the story of the tournament early on uh, with a couple of really big upsets, clinching a spot in the 2021 uh, or 2020 World Baseball Classic. Uh, really exciting for that team and for Mike to have that experience. So I got to talk to him about that. And I'll talk to Ian about what we saw down in Fort Myers. Uh, first, some things I got to get out of the way. Please make sure you subscribe and rate and review. Uh, we're on iTunes. We're on Stitcher. We're on Google Play Music. We're on YouTube. Subscribing is the easiest way for you to know when new episodes are out. And rating and reviewing really helps us get in some new ears, helps with those algorithms, however the heck they work. I don't know. But uh, really, if you leave us a good review and some feedback, we'd really appreciate it. Also, thank you to the Ludlow Thieves for our intro music. Go check out their stuff on iTunes, Amazon, Spotify, however it is that you listen to music. The track you heard at the top of the show is called All the Money. It's a great track. Go check them out. They're doing great stuff. Uh, We love getting your emails. Send those to podcast at SoxProspects.com. Got a question? Got a concern? Got something you want to hear us talk about on the show? Send it into podcast at SoxProspects.com. Or you can tweet to us using the hashtag AskSP. That's A-S-K-S-P. Uh, and last, and by no means at all least, we've got a new thing. It's called a Patreon. It's how you can show your support for the podcast by donating a certain amount of money per episode uh, to help us fund costs like for things like technology, for things like travel. It's really helpful. We do this for free. Uh, we've wanted to maintain this model where we rely on readers who want to go above and beyond and donate and support us in that manner. Uh, not unlike public television, I guess. Uh, I was watching Downton Abbey earlier tonight, so I guess you could say we're the Downton Abbey of the Red Sox minor league farm system. I think it's an apt analogy. I'm getting I'm getting a glare from my wife. I don't think she agrees. But anyway, uh, again, it's patreon.com slash socks prospects. P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash socks prospects. You go on there, you sign up, you say I want to donate a dollar, two dollars, five dollars per episode. Uh, and whenever we do a new episode, this is gonna be the first one that we're gonna post on there. Uh, we will, you know, you know, charge you however it works, uh, and you'll be able to support us. For very little uh, per per episode, we do about 20 to 25 episodes per season. We might try and do a little bit more now that we've got uh, our wonderful producer, Joe Tetralt, doing the editing on the show, taking a lot of work off my hands. So, again, the address is patreon.com slash Sox Prospects. Make sure you go check that out. We really would appreciate your support. Uh, with all that said, the first thing we are going to do is throw to my interview with Mike Myers. Myers spent last season... Uh, with the high A Salem Red Sox splitting time between low, uh, left and right field. Uh, it was his fourth full season in the system. Actually had kind of a quietly solid season is the way I described it in the article about the inter- based off the interview, I should say. That's up on news.soxprospects.com. You can go check that out. It's got some more information on how Team Israel did in the World Baseball Classic, uh, some of the selection stuff. Well, how was Myers selected for the team? I was able to uh, talk with someone uh, who was involved in the selection process. Uh, but uh, it was a really great opportunity to talk to Mike. I talked to him on Sunday, the last day of our trip down in spring training. Uh, the guys had a really easy day. They just went out for a hitting competition. Uh, they were done by 11 a.m. and they got to go back inside. But Mike was nice enough to come and talk to me for about 10, 15 minutes. And uh, it was really great to get to talk to him. So the first thing that I wanted to ask Mike about was, uh, you know, when he got back in and I wanted to know how, what the process was uh, for being selected for the team. So uh, here's Michael talking about uh, how when he got back in and me asking him, uh, what happened? When did you know that this was something that was in the offing for you? 
Halfway through the season last year, one of the Mariners pro scouts came up to me after a game in P- Potomac okay. and said, hey, are you Jewish? <laughs> and I was, okay. like, I was like, yeah, like, why are you asking? He was saying that they were looking for like Jewish minor league guys, big league guys to play for Team Israel and that okay. I was on their radar. W- it wasn't Jason Lefkowitz, was it? No, I don't think okay. so. Okay, all right, because my former roommate is a Mariner scout now and was on the selection committee. Um, okay, so came up to you in Potomac. Was it surprising to you? Like, what was your response at first? Like, yeah, I was just like, uh, I mean, I'm not Israeli, so okay, I don't right. know how I would possibly play for Team Israel. Mm-hmm. He was just like, how the citizenship works is as long as you're Jewish, uh-huh. you can play for us. So I was like, yeah, I mean, I'm Jewish. So okay. if it's a possibility, I for sure want to. Yeah, yeah. All right, so the, the qualifier was last fall in Brooklyn. You guys played against Brazil. Great Britain. Um, Great Britain and uh, why can't I remember Pakistan. the team? Pakistan, okay. Yeah. Um, at what point were you locked in, confirmed for that? At what point was, was, did you know you were on the roster for that, at least? Um, it was near the end of the season. Okay. They, the, the head coach, Jerry Weinstein, gave me a call and said mm-hmm. that I was going to be making the team and nice. coming with them to Brooklyn. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. I mean, once he called, I was pretty pumped. Uh-huh. Oh. And it's, it was a great opportunity to start off with. And then, right. Now, Brooklyn, I, was Brooklyn there? Because I know they're newer in the New York Penn League. Was that was that team in the New York Penn League when you were yeah, down yeah, in the Yeah, yeah okay. I went to Brooklyn. Okay. I was in so you're there with the team. Confident that you guys were going to qualify? I mean, it's not exactly – it was basically you guys in three th- countries that aren't necessarily baseball hotbeds. Yeah, I mean, uh, there was, like, a good amount of guys that had played on this qualifying team mm-hmm. four years prior, so, like – we all got together. They kind of told us about their experience and how they kind of like devastatingly lost four years ago okay. in the championship. So it was kind of like we're better now, so mm-hmm. we expect to win. So, mm-hmm. Looking at the, the roster, there's a decent number of former Sox guys between Breslow, LaVarnwe, and some more recent guys like Decker and, and the enormous piece of humanity known as Nate Fryman. Yeah. Um, did you know any of them? Did you know any of the other guys on the team? Or was it just kind of a whole new group of guys for you? No, yeah, I didn't know anybody coming into it. Okay. But, I mean, I'd heard good things about a lot of the guys, so yeah. I kind of gravitated towards, like, LeVar and Way mm-hmm. and Zai, mm-hmm. and those guys were really, like, welcoming. Mm-hmm. And, and, I mean, it seemed, at least from what was getting reported, that the clubhouse atmosphere that you guys had, I mean, I guess that Decker probably had something to do with it, knowing knowing what I know about him. But it seems like you guys had a good vibe going with the whole mention on the bench thing, which was pretty hilarious. I mean, was it was it that what it was like on the inside too? It was, I mean, it was a lot of fun. I mean, everybody was there just to really have a good time. And I mean, we kind of bonded really, really well as a team, which I think helped the qualifier helped us mm-hmm. big time. We went to dinner together. Like, sure. We had a good time together. Decker, of course, was being Decker. Yeah. Got us going a little bit. So. Okay. okay, so did you know from being on the qualifier roster that being on the actual WBC roster was set, or was it still a question? It was a question. Uh, I mean, he kind of told everybody that they were going to try to get as many big league guys because big sure. league guys weren't allowed to play in the qualifier. Right. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, because they weren't still in season. Still in season, sure. yeah. So it was kind of like... It depends who we get. Like, so, I mean, I kind of was on the fence because they were trying to get Peterson and Ron mm-hmm. and uh, Jock, uh, Jock Peterson Jock and Ron and then Pilar. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Sure. So, sure. Sure. I, if they got those guys, I knew I wasn't going to be on the team. So, I mean, I kind of lucked out. But you wind up making it, yeah. and uh, Pool A was in Seoul. Um, had you first off, let's just start generally. Had you been to Asia before? Because you wind up spending two weeks in Asia, basically. Yeah, yeah no, I'd never been anywhere near Asia. Okay. Yeah. Um, I guess what was the first before we get into the baseball, which at least Pool A is definitely something I got to ask you about because I think it's probably arguable you scored one of the most important runs in World Baseball Classic history. Yeah, um, <laughs> but uh, being over there was, was how, what was it like just being. I guess you're not a tourist, but you're you're over there visiting yeah, I mean, uh, between Seoul and then going to uh, the second round of Tokyo. It was a culture shock for sure. I mean, you walk around, you don't see any like faces you recognize, mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. no one speaks literally a lick of English. Okay. And, and so you're just trying to communicate. You have to point to things like, "Where's the bathroom?" No, they have no idea what you're saying. Okay. Bathroom. I mean, where do I eat? Like, yeah. how do I eat chopsticks? Yeah. It's, it's a different culture. Not good with sure. chopsticks? Not good at all. But, I mean, after two weeks, you... You get good. Yeah, you get good. You got to go try some of the ramen. Uh, at the sushi place over in the town center, I guess. Uh, go practice. Yeah. So, all right, pool A, 
first game of the tournament, um, extra inning game where you guys upset the hosts in Korea. You come in in the 10th inning as a pinch runner for LaVarnway. No, for uh, Ike Davis. Um, score the game running run in the 10th inning. Walk us through that. Did you know you were pinch running if, if someone got the second? What was the situation? I mean, yeah, uh, before the game he told me, I mean, my job was kind of either you'd come in for defense late mm-hmm. or pinch run and try to score the game winning run. Okay. So, no once, one, yeah, <laughs> once that situation came about, I kind of – he looked at me and I was, are you ready? Of course, yeah. yeah. So when he got to first, I thought I was going to pinch run. Mm-hmm. And then when he got to third, I knew for sure I was going to come in. So. Okay. All right. And so then you wind up coming in on the game-winning hit. I forget. I know LaVarnway had walked Scotty, Davis over. Yeah, Scotty Bertram ended up getting okay. an infield single to second base. It was an infield single. Okay. Yeah. So are you just head down running for your life at that point? Or did, did you? Act, was there a read that you had to make at that point? There was two outs. Okay. So, okay. Yeah. yeah, so I was just literally watching the play. I was like, please get through, please get through. Okay. And then he got it, but they had no play. No so play. we were all just. Okay. Did it, did it kind of hit you that you scored the game-winning run in a pretty big international competition, or was it just kind of another game at that point? It was more of just another game. It wasn't like, I mean, being on the bench, I kind of like didn't really feel like yeah. I had contributed all that much. And then just getting in and being able to score that run, I was like, yeah. Really glad that I was able to contribute. At, at what point did you guys realize? I mean, I guess when you win the first game and you're knocking off probably the favorite in the pool, did you realize that coming out of Pool A was something that could happen? Because, I mean, the favorites were probably Korea and the Netherlands. Yeah. Um, I mean, going in, we thought we had a shot for uh-huh. sure uh-huh. because we had there, we played exhibition games. And, like, we had beat the team that had beat Korea in the exhibition games. So I said, okay, we definitely have a chance. And then as that game kept going and was tied, right. going into the late innings, I was like, okay, now we, we definitely could. We had a good squad, I mean. Yeah. You mentioned bonding at the qualifier. I mean, how much do you think that helped where you, you've played with most of these, these guys on a team before, whereas I'm sure most of those guys you were playing against, I mean, the Netherlands team, you've got guys playing out of position. You've got, you know, I mean, they know each other, but did, did that kind of actually actual team chemistry you have helped a lot, do you think? I think in any game, like Mm -hmm. bonding as a team, it just, it helps any team. If your talent isn't quite as good as like ours was not as good as the Netherlands, Mm -hmm. but to be able to like know that we had each other's backs, Mm -hmm. to know that we're not going to pick fights with each other. I mean, we were all cheering cheering for each other. If we're on the bench that game, Mm -hmm. you want everyone to do well. It's a different dynamic, like being in the minor leagues where, so we were all for one cause and I Mm -hmm. think it was awesome. Um, so you guys advanced out of Seoul to ground two in Tokyo with uh, the Netherlands as well. I guess I should probably ask, did you talk with Bogarts at all because he was on the Netherlands squad? Did you run into him other than at the field? or uh, did, I mean, do you have do you know him very well at this point? I guess it's probably the first question. Yeah, I mean, no, I don't I don't really know him. I've seen him a couple of times. I've talked to him a couple of times. Yeah. And we're in, in Seoul. Mm-hmm. I saw him at the hotel a couple okay. of times. We said, hey, like, yeah. how's it going? But yeah. more than that, it wasn't okay. much. All right. Um, and then you guys go to Tokyo, which the Netherlands and uh, Japan came out of. Um, won, won the first one, I think, too. Knocked yeah, off yeah, um, Cuba. Cuba. Yeah, which, hey, I mean, it's still Cuba. It's a big one. That's a big win. Yeah. I mean, it, just looking back on the whole experience, what you guys did, you qualified for the next World Baseball Classic, I believe, by virtue of coming out of Pool A. Yeah. I mean, do you see it as a – I mean – Granted, Team Israel is a, a bunch of Jewish American baseball players for the most part. It, 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 how does it feel in terms of an accomplishment? Uh, you know, is it a, something you think like you know young Jewish baseball players can look at and, and kind of see? Oh, well, you know, looking up to you guys, I guess. Is, is, has it sunk in? Is there any kind of perspective you've gained? Uh, yeah, I mean, more than anything, our goal was to grow the game of baseball in Israel, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and I think with how successful that we were Mm -hmm. it definitely is going to help baseball it's going to help fund a uh, baseball facility there okay so that'll help more athletes get involved there Mm -hmm. so i mean for me personally it was one of the best baseball experiences i've ever been a part of Mm -hmm. so i mean i hope i'm on the team again in four years because i think in four years the game will grow in israel and it'll just keep growing that's our goal for sure um, and I believe they had cameras rolling for a documentary of, of some kind. Are, are there any great Mike Myers moments in there we should be keeping an eye out for, or are you keeping a lower profile? I kept a lower profile in the most of it. It was d- 
Decker, of course, <laughs> center of attention, but there was a lot, it was mainly like the big leaguers, and mm -hmm. they kind of were all around them. I might have a couple parts in there, but yeah. nothing, uh, nothing too, too important. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I guess we should probably briefly mention, since we are here at spring training, uh, I guess we're looking at Portland, hopefully, as, as the assignment for this coming year. Yeah. Is that kind of what we're... Yeah, I mean, they told me that I'm going to find the first spot there, so okay. I had a pretty good year in Salem last year, so that's mm -hmm. where I expect to be in. Just going to keep doing my thing. Did being at the World Baseball Classic, now that you're back in camp, how does it feel transitioning back? Do you feel ahead of where you usually are, behind? Um, since game, they were telling me games just started they from did. early camp three days ago. So I'm definitely not behind. I mean, gaining that experience, playing in front of those kind of fans. I mean, there's 55,000 fans against Japan. It's, it's, <laughs> so it's a little different coming back to the backfield and be like, Wow, this is a some, little different. Some parents and autograph creepers <laughs> lurking around, kind of half pretending or half paying attention. Yeah, but it, it makes me want to get to the big league, honestly. Yeah. It's just like, okay, like, if I've played with all these big leaguers. Like, mm -hmm. I understand, like, their routines, like, what's gotten them to where they are. So now it's my turn to get where I want to go and keep working my butt off to get there. Cool. All right. Well, this place has been cleared out for about five minutes at this point, so I'll let you go. Hope to see you in Portland this year, man. Yeah, Appreciate the time. Man. Appreciate it. Take care, man. All right. Thank you to Mike for that great interview. And, again, check out news.socksprospects.com for my story on Mike Myers playing with Team Israel at the World Baseball Classic. Uh, hopefully you enjoyed that interview. I'm now joined by uh, my roommate during the spring training trip, uh, the man who narrowly defeated me in the Sox Prospects Arcade Basketball Championship. Uh, I believe I score of about 309 to 303, if I'm remembering our high scores correctly. Uh, that will be Sox Prospects Director of Scouting, Ian Kundal. Ian, uh, congratulations on your victory. And uh, I would say overall a pretty successful trip, both on the field and off. Yeah, I, I would agree. Um, just I want to thank everyone. I couldn't have done it without the readers. And um, <laughs> it feels great to be a winner again. Um, I, last season, obviously, I was injured during the spring training trip. Um, oh, coming right. back from shoulder surgery, and I couldn't really participate. So uh, it's good to be back on top and uh, winning because winning is fun. We're, we're recording. I, go ahead. Go ahead. And I was just going to say I'm glad because, you know, I, I, I don't know if this was what led me to victory, but I really think the rental car played a big part in my victory because <laughs> it just – that car just screamed – awesomeness and i think that's well, what led it to me let's briefly describe it was a ford focus it was it had but it wasn't just any sport it had focus. it had black rims it did <laughs> and it had neon lighted interior it did it was unlike any rental car i've ever had <laughs> and you were freaking out about the sunroof but yeah i, I, I was yeah because well, no, but usually you have to pay extra for the sunroof i guess and that was literally like the cheapest rental car I could find. It was either and that it, or the painter's van. Yeah, it will. That I should have done the painter's van. That would have been funny. But um, no, I'm happy with. I, I just think that car, just the no, the bat, the no tire grip, just everything about it. Just, oh yeah, you know, it had maybe an eighth of an inch for victory. An eighth of an inch of so, tire tread. Yeah, that's a generous eighth of an inch right there. I remember we measured it on the key, and it was like barely up to the first cutout. <laughs> Oh. It's a miracle we didn't die on our draft support chart. <laughs> that would have been that would have been really bad. Luckily, yeah, the traffic kept this, kept this kept this from going too fast. Um, Seriously, all right. And so cruise I, control can't forget that. And what? Cruise control. Oh, cruise control. That's true. Greatest thing invention ever. Um, we should point again. Just run our mind, everyone. The first half of our trip, Ian and I recapped in the last episode of the podcast. So please go check that out. And there's on the news page too. Um, yes, it went, true. The, Wednesday, the Tuesday and Wednesday notes went up last week, Thursday's and going up Thursday tomorrow. notes will be up by the time you're listening to this, I believe. Most likely. Yeah, be. Well, yeah, because they're going to be up tomorrow morning, or they're going to be up Thursday morning, so or Wednesday morning. Sorry. That is, unless you're like awake at midnight when if Joe's able to get this up tonight. That's a valid point. They Joe's will be up Wednesday morning um, for those interested, and uh, it should be a good addition. Um, we're going to kind of hit more in depth on some of the guys we talked up on the lad on the last podcast. Excuse me. Mm -hmm. So yeah, and then um, look for two more editions of the notes based on what we talk about today. Mm -hmm. And Matt's got a piece on Josh Ockamy that's uh, about to hit editing as well. So. A lot of content. It's of kicking content. off. Season is coming. And it's not come soon enough. Hashtag content. All right. Well, uh, Ian, let's let's just jump right into it then. Um, on Friday, so we we talked on Thursday night. 
Uh, on Thursday, we had seen Brian Mata and uh, Sean Anderson. Yep. Uh, I believe uh, that was in Port Charlotte. No, that was not in Port nope, Charlotte. That was in Port, Port Myers. Charlotte. Port Charlotte was Friday, and that was kind of the main event of the trip because we went there and we saw. Again, we, the two of us saw Greenville and Salem every day of the trip. Yeah, it um, it, it wasn't planned like that, but it right. just it worked out that the, way. The reasoning, yeah. the reasoning being that when when we're down there, we're trying to see guys who we're not going to otherwise be able to see, and and for you up in the Northeast, seeing the guys who are in Pawtucket and Portland is a lot easier. Obviously, and then seeing the guys in Salem or, or Greenville or extended for obvious reasons. Exactly. It's it's one of those things we kind of you and I talked about it before the trip. We have like a priority list of guys we want to see. And it's a mix of people we haven't I haven't seen before. Or we The site hasn't seen before. And then obviously the top guys like Jason Groom. And that's a heck um, of a transition. Yeah. And that's we were able to accomplish both those things by seeing the high 18 high and low A games, especially on Friday. Yes, sir. Uh, on, on Friday, we went up to Port Charlotte. We took said road trip in uh, in the whip, so to speak, and uh, headed up to Port Charlotte to see the Red Sox minor leaguers take on the Rays. And again, the, the headliner there was Jason Groom getting the start for uh, for the Greenville Drive squad. Yeah, his first start of spring. Um, in game action, obviously. So that was cool. Uh, many of you checked out on my Twitter. That's at SP Chris Hatfield. The uh, periscope I was doing of Groom's first two innings of action. It looked like he was apparently scheduled for two innings, but he got through them too so quick they threw him out for another two thirds of an inning in the third. Uh, Ian, what did we see out of Jason Groom? Um, we saw a good pitcher. <laughs> um, but <laughs> the no, end. It, Thanks everybody. It, 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 yeah. In all seriousness. Um, it was, it was, I mean, obviously I've seen Groom twice before, so I kind of knew what I was expecting, but there were a few things that stood out to me. Number one was the development of his changeup. I know it's one start, he only, but he only threw, last year when I saw him twice, I think he threw three changeups combined over the two outings. So it was good to see him incorporating the pitch a little more, and actually it was reasonably successful. He got a couple swing and misses with it, showed good arm speed. Um, he looked more comfortable with the pitch last year. He seemed to be, had some trouble feeling it, but this time around it, it could have been uh, maybe, you know, he's in the warm, a little warmer down there. I don't know what it was, but something, it, it, he looked more comfortable with it. And, um, yeah, he got a couple swing and misses with it. The standout pitch of, as it usually is, was his curveball. Um, I think you got a couple video. You, that was your first time seeing it and on the video. You can really see just haters look really bad against it yeah he got some strikeouts on that pitch Both, <laughs> i mean he got strikes looking he backdoored it a couple times and he got some really really ugly swings it, it's a really advanced curveball i mean you we forget that he's only 18 years old and he's going to pitch this entire season at 18 and you just don't see kids his age or players his age with that type of feel for a secondary pitch especially a curveball and it's not one of those slow, loopy curveballs that we've discussed in the past with guys like Henry Owens. You know, it's got depth. It's harder. He really snaps it off. He gets over the top of it, and he can both throw it for a strike or he can bury it down and out of the zone when he's looking to get a swing and miss when he's ahead in the count. And it's it's a legit, you know, it's a 65, 70 potential pitch that will get out at the big league level for sure. Mm-hmm. And then with the fastball, uh, I believe early on you had him 90 to 92 uh, I charted his third inning. He threw, I think he only threw another 11 pitches, and he didn't break 90. He was only up to about 89. Uh, again, first start of the spring, so there may be some velo in there. He's probably just loosening up. But uh, you've seen him higher than that? I've seen him touch 94 like okay. once. But he's usually what I've seen him in the low 90s, the 90, 91, 92 range. Yep. And, I mean, I, I saw some people on Twitter were kind of freaking out about the velocity, and it's – let's sort of take it down a notch. It's the first, first start of spring training and he can be effective even if he's only throwing 90 to 92 miles per hour. I don't think he'll eventually settle that. I think he's got more velocity in his arm and I could see him eventually, you know, sitting, you know, more 91, 90, probably 92 to 94 mm-hmm. in that range. But he's With got Ron. the kind, yeah, he, well, it's got movement in life too. And, but he's got the kind of delivery where he doesn't necessarily need to use you know, put it all on the line and throw as hard as he can for, you know, three innings and then tail off quickly. He's more controlled and, you know, he might have better command and be able to pitch better at 90 to 92 than he could at 92, 94. And that's fine. You know, if he can go six innings throwing 90 to 92, I'd rather that than someone who goes three innings throwing 92, 94, and then is like 88 by the fifth inning. 
you know, he's he's a starting pitcher. He's going to want to work deep in the games, turn over the lineup. And if he can do that effectively at 90 to 92, that's perfectly fine. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I mean, I've, I mean, I made notes on he got a swinging strike on a fastball at 89 in the third. Um, you know, I made a note on the run on some of the, on a fastball he threw at 88. So, and it was effortless. I mean, if he if he tried to dial it up, he definitely could. So, yeah, I would I would definitely say go check out the video. I think it's still on your on the is it on your Twitter account? I think it's no, on the main, main it, site feed. Actually, you're right. It's on at Sox Prospects. Um, I started the day doing video from my account, so there's a, a Raphael Devers BP video on there. Um, and then uh, I think later in the day, I realized it would make a lot more sense to do it from the main site account at, so- at Sox Prospects. Uh, later this week on the YouTube page, which is youtube.com slash Sox Prospects, I'll also be putting up some video that I took using the video camera. So if you want to get the more behind home plate angle um, on a HD video of groom pitching, we will have that also. So check that out. Excellent. All right. Well, the other starting pitcher that day uh, for the Salem squad was uh, 2016 draft pick and Mike Schwarin out of uh, the University of Maryland, the Red Sox fifth round pick. Um, what did we see there, Ian? It, I, I, it was certainly not Jason Groom. Um, how did it compare what we saw out of Schwarin uh, to what you saw from him and Lowell? Yeah, I was able to see uh, a little most of Schwarin's outing kind of jumping back and forth between the fields. And he came out, he was 92 to 94 with his usual, he's got the sink on the fastball from that low three-quarters arm slot. But he really, it seemed to get away from him as the game went on. And obviously, it's early in the start, so that's not that surprising. But he was down at the like 90 to 91 by his second inning. And then by his third inning, he was down like 88 to 90. So the velo dropped off pretty quickly. And he got hit around a little bit. Um, he missed a location with a 93-mile power fastball and lefty hit a home run off it. And that's one of the big questions I have with Schwarin is that his delivery gives lefties a really good look at the ball. Yeah, it's a very low arm slot. And when you have that type of arm slot, you need to have a, a, a pitch to get them out. And for him, that would have to be a changeup. And he threw a couple good ones um, with good arm speed down and away, but he also it was inconsistent, and that's kind of been the issue when I've seen him. I think I've seen him three or four times already over since he signed. Is that he just he can't he doesn't consistently have feel or have his secondary pitches working from outing to outing, and when the changeup isn't working, his other secondary is a slider, which is going to run right into the bat plane or the swing path of lefties. Mm-hmm. So it really limits his ability to get them out. And so, yeah, he needs to work on the secondaries. Um, the slider was actually much harder. He's kind of – it seems like it might be two different pitches. Um, he threw a couple pitches at 77 and 78 that are cur- that look more like a curveball now. Mm-hmm. And he also threw a bunch of – his slider seemed harder. It was like 86, 87 compared to where it was last year when he was just throwing like a 79 to 82 frisbee breaking ball. And I do like having the two separate pitches a lot better. Um, the slider was tight, uh, sharper. Again, he had a few that um, he didn't really snap off, but looked pretty good. And the curveball is more vertical um, down in the low, in the high high seventies. So that was interesting. And I'm um, uh, with his again with his arm slot and lack of a true plus pitch. It might be one of these things where he it's better for him to have you know four average ish pitches. And that's where that curveball could come into play. So that was interesting. And, um, you know, in, in the system that's lacking arms, I'm still not sold on Schwarin as a starter long term. But he is one of the more interesting guys. Um, he's got some pedigree. He's got he's shown the ability to get run his fastball up in the mid 90s with some movement. He's shown a feel for secondaries on, on occasion. So it's going to be interesting to see what happens. And I think he's probably headed to Greenville. And actually, even though he's going to be a college guy headed to Greenville, I think that's a pretty good test for him considering he had a down year last year mm-hmm. and some of the issues I've discussed. Yeah. I mean, tell me, do you think it's fair to almost, it, it, when you're, when you're speaking, when I'm thinking back to what I saw, um, the, I don't know if he's certainly not as big, I don't think, but I'm, it's almost like I'm hearing Justin Masterson without the power sinker. Yeah. I mean, the comp I've been, Told, I've a couple of people have said to me independently has been Vance Worley. I don't know if you remember him. No, I mean, um, it's not like it was he, that long ago, but yeah, but uh, he he was a he's a kind of a swingman type for the Phillies and a couple other mm-hmm. teams, and even had the glasses and everything. And physically, they looked similar. And it was one of those things that he just never had enough stuff to start. 
you know, he had those average-ish pitches, but there just wasn't that knockout pitch or that pitch that was effective enough, enough against lefties that you could turn the lineup over to start. But at the same time, they had the size and the ability to work in deeper into games. So, you know, you could throw him out there for five in- innings if you needed to, or if the starting pitcher got knocked down in the second, you throw him out there. And, you know, that's a valuable role. And if that's what Schwarren turns into, that's a very respectable outcome for where they got him. I think he was a fifth-round pick last Fair, year. Yep. But... Yeah, obviously they're going to develop as a starter, and if he does, if the secondary pitches take a step forward and he shows better command with his fastball, then there is a chance I do think he could be like a back end guy. But there, there isn't much ceiling there. It's more right. of a floor play because the floor is pretty high. You know, hmm. worst case, you, I think he can be a middle reliever. So, okay. um, other pitchers that day, it was really kind of low key. Um, just reading off some names from names from my sheet. There's. Uh, Jonathan Diaz got some got some starter length work in the Salem game. Um, we saw Marcos Lantigua. We saw, uh, honestly, the guy that I would probably point to as a guy who seemed interesting to us was uh, Mitchell Osnowitz over in the Salem game. Uh, was there anyone who, who stood out to you, whether it was one of those guys or someone else? I just realized I have incomplete notes because I was running around trying to get uh, video. The only other guy who was kind of interesting to me from the – low a game was Jorvin Pantoja he's a I think he's 19 I want to say 19 year old Dominican could be wrong with that but um he was lefty lefty with actually he's unlike a lot of the lefties we've discussed this week the guys like uh Odin Odenair Mosqueda and Ooh, Ryan work. got it right that time and Ryan Oduber who actually we haven't discussed on the podcast um, but um just real quick uh Pantoja is out of Venezuela sorry Venezuela like pretty, like pretty much every Latin player in the complex leagues at this point yeah and uh, it's interesting 19 <laughs> yeah sure. and he's listed at 511 175 he looked bigger than that um but he was pretty yeah. skinny still and three quarters arm slot um he was definitely bigger than the guys like oduber and Mesqueda. and uh but three quarters arm slot was up to 92 from the left side um sink on the fastball didn't really have great life but, you know, he's got some movement, um, decent deception, actually, because he's got a little little trunk twist in his delivery. So he keeps the ball behind his back till late. And um, he showed some uh, feel for his change up. Good fade in the low 80s. And breaking ball wasn't great. It was below average, slurvy, 75 to 76. But just as a young lefty, um, as we've kind of seen with the Red Sox these past few years, the bar for left handed relievers is pretty low. You know, if you can throw strikes, keep the ball down and prove that you can get lefties out with some deception or whatever it is, then you're you have the chance to make the big leagues. So he's someone that I'm interested to see. He looks like he's uh, he started a little bit last year, which is actually surprising. I would have just assumed Um, I'm interested to see if they move into a full bullpen role. What kind of happens there? Mm -hmm. Uh, A guy that stood out to me was one who I mentioned, Mitchell Osnowitz. He was a indie ball signee this offseason for the Red Sox, and he's kind of an interesting case. He was drafted in 2014 out of, if I can move this, uh, out of Lindsey Wilson College, which I'm assuming is a JUCO. Um, But he was drafted, he was a third baseman in college and was converted to pitching as a pro um, with the Braves at age 22. Uh, Lasted two seasons in the Braves system and last year pitched in the Frontier League, in Indy League, and... uh, we didn't really expect a lot out of him. He went, but then he went out there and was sitting ninety three to ninety five, touching ninety six from the right side. So, or sorry, he wasn't drafted. He was an undrafted free agent, of course. Yeah. Um, but it, yeah, it was really interesting to see him coming out there pumping ninety three to ninety five, a little bit of ninety six. Uh, he threw what I think might have been a cutter at ninety. I uh, think so. And then he threw a breaking ball at, at eighty seven. Uh, but he really he, – it was a very short outing, uh, the batters. He, he he was the last pitcher of uh, of the game for Salem. And yeah, he was really quick, just one, two, three inning. Yeah, quick one, two, three inning. I charted, let's see, eight, nine, ten pitches. So he probably threw like 11 or 12. I'm sure I missed one or two. Uh, but it was a really quick inning. I, I'm very interested to see what happens there. Uh, generally, a guy going last in the game isn't necessarily a good thing, but uh, he, he definitely looked really intriguing. Uh, certainly as a guy for them to sign as an undrafted free or sign as an indie ball guy, never mind an undrafted free agent. Uh, I want to see what they do with him. After what we saw, we kind of put him, projected him more solidly for the Salem roster. And I want to see uh, if that's what happens and if he gets any run. So. 
Yeah, I think it's just another example of the value of scouting. You know, you got to get out. You can find baseball players pretty much everywhere, um, and you never know what you're going to find. So if this – it's looked pretty interesting. I watched the inning with you. You know, the velo, the velo's there. He's good size. I think he's 6'5", like 240, 250. And um, the secondaries yeah. – I mean, we didn't get to see a lot, as you said, because he only threw like 10, 11 pitches, but he threw one really good slider uh, yeah. for a swing and a miss. I think it was the for, last pitch of the outing or something. Yeah, it was a strikeout uh, down and away from a righty that he just buried in the dirt, which is the perfect spot when you were two, headed in the count with two strikes. So he's definitely someone I'm interested with. Um, yeah. Um, all right, well, let's move on really quickly to the pitchers from Saturday, and then we'll wrap up with the hitters. Um, but, you know, let's – Keep it kind of shorter, I think, maybe. Um, on Saturday, we saw, I guess, the headliner would be, uh, I guess both of them were interesting again on Saturday. As, yeah, good starters. Yeah, so it was Roniel Raude starting for Salem uh, and uh, Darwins and Hernandez uh, throwing for Greenville. Uh, I, for, I forget how we did this. I th- apparently charted the first inning for Hernandez. So why don't you start with uh, with Raude, who you had seen last year, but – uh, you know, the, the the question with Raudes, who spent all of last season in Greenville as a 17-year-old. He was the second youngest player in the league to his at-one-time teammate in Anderson Espinosa. Um, uh, yeah, that. the reports from him have been pretty good this week. Yeah, they've been okay. Let's not go there yet. <laughs> I can't take it. But uh, Raudes kind of looked like more of the same to me based on your report, Ian. Is that what you thought? Yeah, with Raudes, it it's a strange one. Uh, Because I saw him last year with Greenville, and he actually threw pretty well. He threw like six innings, got hit a little bit, but, you know, nothing. But last year in spring training, he got bombed when I saw him. Last Um, year in spring training. Last year in spring training. And then this year in spring training, he got pretty much crushed again. Uh And this has been my concern with him is that he was 89 to 91. You know, mostly outing some down in the 88, 87 range. I actually actually charted his second and third innings now that I'm looking here, and I've got nothing above 90. Yeah, and it's just, you know, he's like 88 to 90, and it's all pitchability. You know, there's not there's not a lot of projection. I don't think he's going to add a lot of velocity, and it's just he has to throw strikes and keep the ball down, and when he wasn't doing that, like in this outing, he's just going to get hit really hard, and the batters were getting really good swings off him, gave up in the first inning. He gave up uh, two singles, a double, and a triple, um, and the double and the triple were both hit really hard. And he did he did end it with a strikeout and he showed some potential with his curveball, a um, couple good downers uh, at 74 to 76 miles per hour, 12 to six break. You know, it's one of those true over over the top overhand curveballs. Mm-hmm. And he also seems to have added a slider to his secondary pitches. He was throwing it looked like 85 to 86 miles an hour mm-hmm. with short horizontal break, which is something he didn't really throw at all last year. Um, and then obviously he had the change up also with some good feel and good arm speed. And, but it's, again, it's, I don't really see, I mean, maybe the curveball you could put a 55 on and the change up, you could put a average to maybe a 55. If you see it on a good day in the slider, I didn't see enough of probably, but you know, a four fringe average at pitch. There's just no real knockout pitch and the velocity is just not there. So he's just going to have to throw strikes. He's going to have to locate and mix his pitches to succeed. And, you know, there's definitely he has the potential to do that, but that's really a tough road to go down, especially when you're when you're as young as he is, that you're kind of getting shoehorned into that command and control four pitch guy. Mm-hmm. So it's 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 going to be interesting because in the system lacking starting pitching depth, he obviously is one of the higher end ones, mm-hmm. but at the same time, there just really isn't much ceiling there. And so the margin for error is pretty low. And if he gets the high minors and you know, the command doesn't develop or secondaries kind of all stay hover around below average to fringe average pitches, then there's problems and the stuff won't play in a bullpen role. So right. that's yeah. Problematic. Well, it's also a funky delivery too. And you just wonder in the South Atlantic league, a funky delivery might be all you need, frankly. Well, exactly. And he, against some of the hitters, when I saw him last year, he was just – guys don't really – a lot of guys are young. They don't really know how to handle good breaking pitches. you know. So he could get by with his curveball and by locating the fastball. But as he faces more advanced hitters, they're going to lay off those breaking balls that are out down and out of the zone mm-hmm. and uh, his changeup. And they're just going to sit on his fastball. And if he misses location at all, you know, that's going hit, to get hit pretty hard. Yeah, I mean, I'm looking at, you know, my charting, and there's one... He faced a pretty lefty-heavy lineup 
Uh, and I'm looking at one at bat he had against a right-hander where he went 87 mile per hour. Might have been a two-seam uh, that was low. Uh, a curveball at 74 for a ball low. Uh, a changeup at 84 for a swinging strike. And uh, a 75 mile per hour curveball that got hit back up the middle for a single. And, and you know when you get to a level where the fact that you're mixing pitches like that isn't necessarily going to be enough to flummox hitters, that's going to be an issue for him. Yeah, definitely. And it's one of those things as you said, like he threw one fastball in that whole sequence. Mm-hmm. That's not ideal. You know, you need, you can't get, you can't get through outings throwing, you know, not basically relying on your secondary pitches and only throwing a handful of fastballs. You need to be able to establish the fastball in order to allow those secondary pitches to play. Right. And that's one of my big concerns with him is I'm not sure he can do that unless he's got pinpoint command at, you know, 90 miles an hour. Yep. Yep. Um, the other pitcher we saw starting that day was Darwin's and Hernandez, who you saw in Lowell and, and you were pretty impressed with. Um, it, I, I started charting him on the outing, and I guess I'll, I'll take it from the top. You can jump in. But uh, I had him sitting 92 to 94 uh, in, in his first inning. I think, yeah, he touched 95 at one point. Uh, actually, kind of funny, real quick on Rowdy's, I thought it was kind of funny. He got a swinging strikeout on an elevated 90 mile per hour fastball which was kind of interesting, but you compare that with Darwinson, who was throwing, like I said, 92 to 94, touch 95, uh, curve that was anywhere between 74 and 79. Uh, didn't really throw a whole lot of secondaries in his first inning, but uh, as he kind of worked into things. But it was exactly what I kind of expected out of him, where stuff may have been better with him, Rodas, but the, the command and control certainly wasn't there. Exactly. His stuff is vastly superior to Rowdy's, both velocity um, not not like the whole arsenal, just but yeah, the raw. He's got the velocity. He actually his secondary pitches, man, they're not as good right now, but no. he'll show a little more potential with them. But they definitely need refinement. But his he just doesn't have that feel or the pitchability right now that Rowdy's does. Um, we saw it last year with Lowell. You know, I think he led the league in strikeout rate or something, or led the spinners in strikeout percentage. Sorry, yeah. but he also walked. You know. 36 guys in 48 innings and had outings where he couldn't get out of the first inning because he'd have five walks. And that's kind of his thing is the stuff is there, but it's just, can he throw enough strikes? And that's what kind of holds him back a little bit for me is that Mm -hmm. it's because he has the build of a starting pitcher and the delivery act is fine, but he just doesn't, it's too inconsistent. And I'm not sure the command he's going to get into the necessary level of command to be able to stick it out for, you know, five, six innings. Yeah. But Unlike Rowdy's, he has the stuff that could play in a bullpen role. You know, a lefty up to 95, yep. who I've seen him touch, I think he touched 96 actually when I was watching him. But a lefty up to the mid to high 90s, and he's, if he can develop, you know, even an average secondary pitch, that's a big league, a potential big leaguer right there. Right. So. Right. And the thing, I thought, you know, with Hernandez, at least the inning I saw, I noted he had pretty intense arm recoil. Uh, at the end of his at the end of his delivery, it did look like there was a lot more effort than there was with, say, a Rowdes or a Groom. Um, it's kind of easy oh, yeah. to project him in that in that bullpen role. Yeah, definitely. It's there. There's definitely more effort. There's almost everyone has more effort than Jason Groom when they're pitching. To be fair, <laughs> right? True. But true. It's he does have. He's got the quick arm, and it's just his mechanics. They can get kind of all over the place. He doesn't consistently. He doesn't hold his release point consistently. He doesn't repeat his delivery well, and he is going to be entering his. I was looking. He's, it's actually going to be his fourth year with the org, which I thought was I didn't realize. Darwin. So yeah. Really. So yeah. So I mean, he's still only twenty, but. Oh wow! Yeah, I guess he spent two years in the Dominican yeah. Summer League, and then they jumped him straight to Lowell last year. So. Exactly. Which that was a, that was a very necessary step, but at the same time, you know, it's one of those things that within the next two years they're kind of going to have to make a determination is it worth continuing to go down the starter route or do we just you know move into the bullpen and see what happens because i, I do the stuff rule, could play out there. he's rule five eligible this off season. is he really oh yeah. my god you're right yeah so i would not be surprised at all if they if he struggled starting within the first couple of months they just yeah. put him in the bullpen and see what happens because he yeah, had that wow what isn't well because he signed in august of 2013 and when you sign below the age of is 18 or younger it's the fifth rule five draft after you sign so it'll be 2013 2014 2015 2016 2017 
Wow, you're right. That's interesting. Yeah. I did not. I would have thought he was eligible next year. Yeah, that's that's going to be a tricky and, one. I mean, I can get into my rant sometime about how the Rule Five draft rules severely disadvantage um, Latin American Latin prospects. American. It's yeah, kind of infuriating almost. But for another time. Uh, exactly. but yeah, I, that is a good point to see. I, I think they probably give Hernandez at least another year starting. I agree. Uh, you can, I can't imagine he gets drafted in Rule 5 after pitching most of a season in Greenville. Unless he completely breaks out, and at which point they would probably protect him, I would agree. Yeah, I, I, I can't see a team. I mean, Jason Garcia, when he's throwing 100, is one thing. But I mean, but with lefties, though, you know, there's teams. Yeah, I, the Padres I mean, the Padres did it last year with Luis Perdermo. Um, I believe they took him. I'm typing, so I apologize for that. I believe they took him from the Pirates, I want to say. They took him straight out of A-ball from who is Palm Beach or Peoria. No, the Cardinals, sorry. So they drafted him straight out of A-ball from the Midwest League. And... Um, he spent they they stuck with him all last year. Granted, he really struggled, but so it is plausible at least. I I, I still want to do lyrics to uh, Straight Outta Compton right now, based on how you said Straight Outta A Ball. But I'm gonna save our <laughs> I'm gonna save our listeners from that. Um, plus, we're trying to get through this quickly. Uh, some other pictures we saw that day in the low A game. We saw Hunter Smith uh, throw a couple of innings. Ryan O'Duber, I got to see. We talked about him, I think, on the last episode, right? Um, I don't think we talked about him, but yeah, he doesn't throw very hard. Sitting 80, which was... 81. I saw an 82. I saw um, some 79s, too. I saw 78. <laughs> I saw him through... He was throwing something at 75 to 76. That this I, is a change-up. I don't know how I you think. do a change-up at four miles per hour lower than your fastball. Yeah, sure. that, he, he's an interesting case. Yeah. Um, anyway, but, that's more than we should probably even talk about him. Uh, Jose Gonzalez, who threw from a low three quarters at... Uh, like 88, 89. 80, yeah, I had 86 to 89. Yeah. Uh, actually, I had 80, I had a couple at 82, 82 and 83, and then he sat 85 to 87, touching 89, which I did not expect from a guy who had really good stats in the DSL last year. Shows you again, stats, DSL nah. stats especially. Can't, can't read too much into them. Very little. Uh, we saw Denny Reyes, who I did not write any notes on, and then over he was. He was 86, 88. Yeah. Um, he's a big frame, but there's effort in the delivery. And, right. yeah. Uh, and then over at the high A field, we saw... Um, uh, well, you, you left out probably the most interesting guy who actually we is going to make a pretty decent jump in the rankings. Who's in that? In Joan, Joan Martinez. Oh, okay. Mike, did he throw Mike's, that day? He did. Mike's boy. He threw twice while we were down there, actually. Okay. He was much better this time than the last time we saw him. Okay. Um, cause it, he's interesting because actually I was just thinking about it. And when I was, was in the instructs, I saw the same number of games and he threw twice. He was the only pitcher I saw throw twice down there. And I think That's he's someone who's never, what? That's not true. You saw Nagosik twice. No, I'm talking saying in instructs last year. Oh, in instructs. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. I believe he it has never started since he joined the org. Is that right? John, John Martinez. Yeah. He only hit last year was his debut and he, he, uh, made 18 relief appearances in the DSL. Yeah, so he's never – he's been a straight reliever. He was their closer actually last year it looks like. And he was 94-96 um, with long arm action, but the pitch had some late run. He had a uh, two-plane slider at 82-83 and a long sweepy curveball at 78. He also threw a changeup at 88 that wasn't very good. But he's just interesting as kind of an arm strength righty who mm-hmm. they seem to find. Right. Right. And he was that he's the one I actually talked about a couple podcasts ago as someone who, you know, will come back in two years and he's be throwing like eight ninety seven to ninety nine. And uh where it looks like we're on that way because he was ninety four, ninety six and versus last year when I saw him, I think he was You have well, ninety actually, ninety one to ninety five on his uh scouting report on the site right now. Yeah, and he was ninety three three ninety five when I first saw him on Wednesday. So then, you know, ninety four, ninety six in this outing and last year in instructs he was 91 93 so well, I mean, stuff's in, starting in a to couple tick months up. in a couple months he's going to be throwing 120 at that rate and you never know so uh <laughs> if michael Kopech can throw a 105 anything is possible but the stuff is starting to tick up already and it's you know relief only but someone who's kind of interesting in a system full right hand for lead whereas you don't throw very hard mm-hmm. yep um yeah he was definitely interesting he debuted and it was made he's going to make an appearance in the we've got kind of a temporary set of rankings that as a placeholder we edited. as yeah. a placeholder we're going to do a little bit more shuffling to the back end over the course of the week and then they'll go final probably on friday 
as our spring training rankings. Um, all right, so let's move along really quickly. On the other field, pitching was Rob. Uh, Rob, I want to say Richie Sexton, but it's not Richie Robbie Sexton. Sexton. It's Richie Robbie Sexton. Sexton. Was awesome, though, I know because he, he was like six foot ten. Except he ruined my boy Clay Meredith's, Meredith's career, and I'm never going to. Did he hit a grand him. slam off him? And it's like second right? bat in the major yeah. leagues. Yeah, yeah, that's why um, I remember. Yeah. So Robbie Sexton threw. Uh, I'll, I'll, why do I want to say our Janice Martinez? God, Al Janis. Al Janis Martinez. Uh, Pat Getz. Uh, I mentioned Steven Nagosik and Austin Glorious, who. Uh, was our second time, your second time seeing him in camp. Uh, Glorious, who's a guy we get asked about a lot, sat 91 to 95, uh, threw one slider at 83, uh, in my charting at least. Had a quick inning. Looked all right. Yeah, I, I wasn't watching that outing, so. I yeah, it was pretty good. I mean, it was a strikeout, a strikeout of 4 3 and a pop up to, to shortstop in the last inning of the high A game. It sounds like his velocity was up a little bit from the last when he pitched up in uh, up in Port Charlotte when we saw him on, I want to say, through Wednesday. Mm. So that's a good sign. But as I said, he's someone I'm intrigued with uh, in a relief role. You know, he's kind of got the tools. I've seen him up to like 96, 97 before in short spurts with Lowell. So the velocity is in there. It's just there's effort in the delivery and – He's got, you know, he's got some secondary pitches. I think it's sliders, his primary one, if they're like a little cutter too. Mm -hmm. But in a relief only role, it's definitely interesting. Yep. And the other guy I would say for me was Robbie Sexton. Mm -hmm. He was someone I saw at Instructs, kind of liked um, just because he's left handed and he could had feel for his change up. And uh, in this outing, the thing that was interesting to me was the fastball velocity. He was like 89, 88 to 90 in Instructs last year. I saw him top out at 91. In this outing, he topped out at 93 and he was sat 90 to 92. Mm-hmm. So as a lefty, you know, if you can sit low 90s with feel for a changeup, that's definitely interesting as we talked about earlier. So, yeah. Excellent. Um, I want to apologize if I'm sniffing into the microphone. Uh, my mute button is being covered by a sleeping cat right now. So I can't reach my mute button. Apologies. Um, all right. Well, that's it for the pitchers. I, I guess really, really quickly on the hitters um, because we do kind of have to wrap up. Wrap up. Um, on that day, one thing that was intriguing, and I bring this up in part because we were just talking about this, Ian, but on uh, on Friday uh, in the high A lineup, Tyler Hill started in left field with uh, Chris Madera in center, but Madera apparently to help him have some more versatility uh, as a guy on a roster, you know, kind of filling out one of those organizational slots, shifted over to second base with Hill shifting from left to center which I thought was really interesting. Uh, we, we've talked about on the podcast before about how Hill's profile as a left field only type really puts a lot of pressure on the bat. I haven't really seen anything to make me believe he can stick in center, but if he can, uh, that certainly makes him interesting. Yeah, I mean, that would be very good for him, but I, I didn't see him play center. And I don't I think he don't, got any work out there, really. I don't I don't buy it because he wasn't good in left field when I saw him. As I'll, It's in tomorrow's write-up, I want to say. I think talking talking about Thursday's games, um, Mm -hmm. he butchered a ball in left field. Like it was a no, that wasn't Thursday's game because I'm pretty sure Mike was there. Yeah, I think it was Friday before the switch. Yeah, it was Friday's game. Um, No, Saturday's game. It would have been. It was Saturday, right? right, Because Friday we were in Port Charlotte. Yeah, Saturday he got a fly ball over his head. It, It was catchable. It was very catchable, and turned the wrong way that he got turned around again and zigzagged his way and the ball just hit off his glove and, and ended up in like a triple. And that's the kind of stuff that I saw consistently in Lowell last year. It was a lot of, you know, little bloop that he'll take a step back on and just miss or take the ball in the gap and he'll run straight to the ball and it'll end up going over his head. Whereas if he had run at an angle, you know, he had a better chance to catch it, things like that. And the arm just isn't there either. It's like a 40 arm if you're generous below average. And that was with – I saw um, a very intense infield outfield with throws to home plate and a, he did make a throw in game too. Mm. So I've got a few good looks at it and it just – it's not there. So I have, I have a hard time seeing him stick in center field if he's not barely past. He's not really – he's below average in left field. Right. right. All right. Um, maybe do you want to pick one more guy as a hitter to talk about or should we just – yeah, I would say um, just a couple of the younger guys I, that were kind of interesting. Um, Ramfis Baroa mm. is a Dominican, I'm going to assume, or it could be Venezuelan. I'm paper shuffling right now. 
to stall. I can, I can he, hear. Is, he is Dominican. Uh, he's listed at 6'2", 190 on the roster. And he showed some interesting tools, but at the same time, he probably will never get above A-ball. And <laughs> here's why. It's, it's big raw power. Um, he hit what was described to me by people watching a like 500-foot home run in the game on Friday, I want to say. No, the game on uh, Thursday. And it was, I guess, fastball, like low 90s fastball, and then he just turned on it and just absolutely destroyed it. He also showed off a plus arm in right field, uh, hosing, throwing down out a runner at the plate in the game in Port Charlotte on Friday. So it's, you know, there's potentially two plus tools in power and arm. But at the same time, the swing is very long. It's all or nothing. There's going to be a ton of swing and miss. And, yeah, so there's a lot of red flags. But it was just, you know, he made some noise. And in a system that's pretty devoid of position player prospects, it was, you know, interesting to see someone with a few loud tools. The other guy is someone who's kind of a – he's kind of been an enigma to me because he's been in the organization for like three years and I'd never seen him play in a game, let alone like other than in workouts. So he kind of – as far as I was concerned, he wasn't a real person. And he finally played. Actually, he had on. Um, he wasn't very good the first couple of days, but on the Saturday game, Nick Hamilton had like three hits. All right. And if he can ever hit, that's interesting. Just because he is, he is like a true eighty runner. He was uh, like four seconds down the line, like sub three or sub four seconds on a bunt, and on a jailbreak, it was four, uh, like four o. Oh, four or something so it's like 75 80 speed mm-hmm. and he's look he's athletic he can really run but it's just really raw you know the swing mechanics aren't very good chops down on the ball there's no power at all mm-hmm. and i was like in his career you know he has he has under 100 at bats in his career right so it's just one of those things if he ever can figure it out a little bit and just get on base there there's interest it's interesting because of the speed but at this point, you know, I need to see it outside of the complex leagues. I need I mean, I need to see him get on base before you can even, you know, consider him as a prospect. But that was it was just good to see him have a good day. He made some hard contact, had a double, a triple, um, mostly speed based. But still, you know, it was interesting to see him have just play baseball. He does have that kind of curse of the repeat GCL player, but yeah. uh, intriguing nonetheless intriguing uh, and i'm trying to just look through briefly if there was anything else of note um oh bobby doll back homer didn't he i'm sure he did i believe that was a saturday game yeah yeah he did he did um he's, he's got he's got some raw we've talked about, about say, it yeah he's got raw power and other than that yeah that's well, pretty let's much it mention on <laughs> sunday they did a hitting competition um with one finalist from each of the clubs competing in the finals and uh, so i was talking with myers about it and he was he even admitted that the guys had no idea what the rules were um but the final i didn't understand it at all <laughs> yeah, it was not clear at all what the rules were but the finalists were jake romanski from the portland team uh, no, Tate, Pawtucket. uh Pawtucket, i mean uh, tate matheny from portland dahlbeck from salem uh who was greenville tucker tubbs from tucker greenville. tubbs from greenville and from the rookies it was baroa Right. Yes. Yeah, Ramphus. Ramphus, Baroa, and uh, the the winner was Tate Matheny for some reason. Uh, I'm know. not quite sure. I thought I, I, Dahlbeck was a lot more impressive, but I guess there were specific things that we're looking for. Yeah, so. it was a situational hitting contest or something, and Dahlbeck was just pulling a lot of home runs, which is yeah. <laughs> I don't know what si- I don't know what situation that'd be bad in, but yeah, sure. Um, all right. Well, uh, I, should we uh, should we stick a fork, or, or I guess with this being the spring training trip, a pair of uh, a pair of chopsticks in it? Then yeah, I think that pretty much wraps it up. Just obviously, yeah, as I said earlier, um, there'll be a couple more write ups coming up for spring training. Yeah, keep your so eye on we'll, the news page. We'll talk about a few more guys that we didn't get to hit on today. Excellent. And just get ready for the start of the year because it's coming very soon. Yeah, make sure you get your questions to podcast at SoxProspects.com. We've got a couple in the hopper. Sorry we didn't get to them yet, but uh, we're going to uh, eventually get to those probably on the next episode of the podcast. Uh, we'll do those. Uh, but like I say, if you want to get them in, podcast at SoxProspects.com or tweet using the hashtag AskSP. That's A-S-K-S-P. Uh, you don't have to tweet at us. Just use the hashtag. We'll see it. Trust me. 
uh, get those out there and we'll read your questions on the air. Uh, again, we want to thank all of our supporters on Patreon. Go to patreon.com slash Sox Prospects. Uh, this is going to be the first episode I think that we're going to put up there. So thank you to all of our supporters on Patreon. Uh, I think that's it, Ian. For Ian Cundell, my name is Chris Hatfield. Thank you, everybody, for downloading. We'll be back at you soon. And, of course, we have to thank our patrons over at patreon.com, uh, including Brian Morelli, Lendell Martin, and Cody Pimentel, all frequent emailers of the show. Uh, thank you to those gentlemen as well as everyone else supporting us over on Patreon. Again, that's patreon.com slash Prospects.